Thanks, Fraser. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, automatic gas bound analysis. Um, and yeah, I'd like to start with this XKCD comic. So it's about a developer who has like two strategies of implementing something and most time is spent with yeah, uh, thinking about which one is more efficient. Um, <laughs> And so, um, yeah, how is that related to, to smart contracts? So um, here probably everybody uh, knows what a, a smart contract is. So it's a program that's um, stored on the blockchain to carry out some uh, financial uh, transactions. So um, they have a state. Um, uh, well, the state can, of course, be modified, but the program itself, after you publish it, cannot be modified anymore. That's a part of the uh, point of it. So. Um, then um, um, the um, execution cost of these smart contracts um, always plays a role one way or another. So um, the, the reason is um, that you have like uh, this distributed system and people have to agree on the outcome of an execution and that um, makes the system vulnerable to denial of service attacks. So one way to deal with that, which is uh, done for instance in Ethereum, is to introduce this notion of gas and have the users pay in advance for the execution cost. Um, yeah, so the way that works is when you want to interact with a smart contract, you have to provide some amount of gas. So this is kind of like the currency you use for the uh, pay for the execution cost. If you um, pay a sufficient amount, then the uh, remaining gas is returned to you. If it was insufficient, then all your gas is lost and um, the transaction does not happen. If the gas was sufficient, so then your transaction ends up in a new block. Um, if you're uh, lucky, yeah, I'm leaving out a lot of details here. So the actual um, cost of the transaction also depends on the gas price, um, but this is not so relevant um, for this talk. So um, yeah, why, um, or well, maybe I start with the, the outline first. So I uh, first uh, tell you a little bit uh, about yeah, why um, we want to predict um, this gas use statically and I then um, give you a very brief overview of a line of work, um, automatic um, amortized resource analysis that has been um, developed for the last 20 years actually to um, automatically reason about the resource cost of, of programs, not in the context of smart contracts, but then I uh, talk about yeah, why this is um, a great fit for, for smart contracts, this particular uh, technique, and yeah, then I'll uh, conclude, so that's uh, the plan. So uh, first the motivation, so why are we interested in predicting the sta uh, gas cost statically? So what you could of course do is you could, um, before you execute a transaction, run it offline, see what the gas cost is, but this is unsound because the um, contracts have stayed, right? And then you can never be sure when your transaction um, is executed. Um, you might also be interested in the cost of um, interactions with a, a contract in a distant future because um, you might want to know that for you know some economic analysis, right? Do you want to use start using this contract if you have like you know very high gas cost in the in the future? So um, that's also something that is uh, difficult to test. Um, but then also um, the gas cost really needs to be part of a uh, functional correctness argument because you can use uh, the, the gas cost either intentionally or unintentionally with a bug to disable functionalities of contracts de facto. So yeah, even if you um, proved something, right, that you, for instance, or at any time you can, you know, extract your money from the, from the context, this might not be true if you take into account the gas cost. And that's something that um, does happen in a practice. So here is uh, one example. Uh, this governmental contract was a contract on the uh, Ethereum blockchain. It was a lottery. So uh, the interaction you could have with the contract is you could buy a ticket and then you know the, you have to wait a while, like uh, a bunch of blocks have to, to be mined and then like a winner is determined and then you, if you're the winner you can you know collect the jackpot you have won the lottery. Um, however, there was a problem. So there were like these two um, harmless looking lines of code in there um, that reset the, the lottery at the time when the checkpoint is collected. And so there was an array of um, you know, participants and um, the uh, some amounts. So I think uh, probably you could, yeah, I don't remember that actually you probably could um, um, put in like uh, an amount of money to buy multiple tickets or something like that. 
Um, yeah, anyway, but so this uh, looks harmless, but this has a very high gas cost because it's a lot of memory operations because the old arrays kind of like have to be erased. You can think about it like that. So um, it didn't make sense um, for the winner to actually collect the jackpot because the gas cost was too high and then all the money was stuck in the, in the blockchain and nobody had an incentive to, to get it out there. So, and I think here in this case, there was a bug, but um, you could of course also like design a system or like a smart contract purposefully to uh, turn on the switch and increase the gas cost. Um, so um, maybe this whole um, idea of the, the gas is um, a bad idea. Um, so if we uh, widen the scope a little bit and think about that, so well, maybe it is a bad idea, but um, if you come up with like alternatives, right, and this like uh, distributed um, a setting with uh, like untrusted agents, so the um, execution cost of your um, um, contracts will play a role um, most likely one way or another, right? You could think like, okay, we somehow, you know, people have to agree on the outcome of the execution, so you could so they either have to run it again, at least, you know, some um, other parties have to run it, or you could maybe have an idea to come up with some kind of like certificates, right? That you say like, okay, um, the certificate shows that this is the outcome of the computation, but also with this, um, you're gonna um, most likely run into this denial of service um, attack scenarios. So um, yeah, in any way, the, the um, um, yeah, execution cost of these contracts um, is, is important. Um, Okay, so um, how can we reason about the um, execution cost? So um, there's this technique, this automatic amortized resource analysis um, yeah, that um, has been, I thought I had this here, um, has been uh, developed for, for a while. Um, so it solves the following problem. Um, given a program P, we would like to know what is uh, the worst case resource consumption of P as a function of the size of its input and a resource here for this technique, is, uh, it's parametric in the resource, can be something like gas, uh, can be something like heap space, stack space, or like very specific resource, amount of data sent over a network. So it works for all of those. Particularly, it works also with resources that can become available again, um, like heap space or gas in, in some systems. Um, and we are not interested in asymptotic bounds. We need concrete constant factors yeah, for this domain and also others like Don Knuth did in, in this book, The Art of Computer Programming, yeah, also gets like these concrete constant factors. The difference here is that we wanna do this automatically, fully automatically. And um, we also would like to have a soundness theorem and um, some proof certificates that we can then like attach to the contract um, uh, that, that is easily verifiable um, and proves that the, the uh, bound is correct. Okay, so um, how does this um, approach work at a high level? Um, so um, goal is to derive these bounds and we first um, define a mathematical model of um, the uh, resource cost. Yeah, we call that an operational cost semantics. We then um, define a type system or a program logic that you can use to reason about the, the cost to prove these uh, bounds. We show then that like this type system or the program logic is uh, sound with respect to the mathematical model. And then we come up with an inference algorithm to automate the derivation um, of the types or the um, Hoare triples. And um, then we implement the system and um, show with um, an implementation experiments um, that it's uh, practical, hopefully. Of course, it's undecidable to um, derive these resource bounds, but still you can try um, to uh, do it for um, as, uh, or for like uh, maybe most programs that are written in, in practice. So this undecidability result does not uh, prevent you from doing that. So um, uh, maybe one slide that is a little bit more uh, technical. So um, how, uh, so it's called um, automatic amortized uh, resource analysis. So it's a um, automation of amortized analysis that you might remember from your um, algorithms uh, course. And so the way it works is you can think of a program as being like a control flow graph and at every node at the program you define um, a potential function and this potential function has to be defined in a way so that the potential at this node, uh, no matter what the program state is, is uh, sufficient to cover the cost of the uh, next uh, possible tran transitions um, and the potential at the next node. 
Um, so and if you uh, do that, then you know um, the initial potential is an upper bound on the cost you will have in the program, no matter what pass uh, you take through the program. So now, um, of course, yeah, that seems um, like a, a good plan, but uh, how can we automate that? And to automate that, we have to fix a format of these potential functions, right? So we say, um, uh, for instance, each potential function is like a polynomial in some of values you have in the program state at, at that point, and you can uh, think of these um, um, kind of like yeah, monomials, let's say, you know, like a basis, um, uh, like in linear algebra, where you say like, okay, the resource bound is this big sum um, with unknown coefficients of all these like base functions, and we want to figure out what these coefficients are. In the end, most of them going to be zero, um, but yeah, it's a bit like yeah, linear algebra. So why would you um, do the analysis in uh, this manner. Um, so there are multiple benefits. So um, first, you never have to reason explicitly about the sizes of the data structures. So that's all taken care of by this potential um, that you have around. Yeah, I can't show you that with an uh, example because I uh, don't have the type. So you just have to believe me. Um, the, um, uh, it's also uh, the analysis is naturally compositional. So usually if you have like, you know, bound for function f and you have bound for function G, then you also have a bound for the composition. Um, and um, this is, um, again, because you have to reason about the size of the, the output. Uh, this is not uh, trivial. The um, inference can be reduced to um, off-the-shelf LP solving, even if you have um, non-linear bounds. So that's another uh, benefit here. So um, we have an implementation um, of this for a functional language. Um, it's called Resource Aware ML, and you can um, try it out online. There's a web interface. You can play with it. Um, just to give you an impression of like what you can do in, in Resource Aware ML. So here are some um, results of the um, automatic analysis. So the uh, resource metric here is something like evaluation steps, but um, yeah, you can think of it like a high level you know, cost uh, uh, metric similar to, to gas. And um, you can see most of the bounds are asymptotically tight, right? So that's the uh, third column, you see the actual asymptotic worst case behavior. An exception is merge sort, um, because in resource aware ML, all the bounds you can derive are polynomial. So merge sort is n log n, right? So you get a quadratic bound, not the n log n bound. Um, but um, the, in general, logarithms can also be handled by this technique, but not in resource aware ML. Um, so for instance, for a quicksort, that's a version of quicksort for a list of lists or list of strings where each comparison takes linear time. So you have a quadratic number of comparisons. Each comparison has linear time. So you have something like you know, m squared times um, n. Um, Right, and the soundness, um, and you also see like it's uh, reasonably fast. Um, so the analysis only takes like a few seconds, sometimes um, even less than a second for these micro benchmarks. Um, the soundness only guarantees that you um, get a sound worst case bound, but it doesn't um, guarantee anything about the quality um, of the, the bounds. Um, and this is something you know, then you can have to um, figure out with experiments. And often, if the analysis can derive a bound, it's also pretty good. So um, here on the left, you have quicksort for, for integer lists, and the blue line is the derived bound, and the red dots is the manually identified worst case inputs that we, uh, the cost for running quicksort with manually identified worst case inputs. Um, and here on the right, and this is a tight bound. And for on the right here, you have long, longest common subsequence, um, also a pretty good bound. But I think that one is not tight. Um, okay, the, this technique also works for imperative languages, where you can integrate it into a, a program logic. But um, the um, uh, benefit you get from the functional setting is that you can get bounds that are uh, functions of like data structures, which is difficult to do in an imperative setting. So in the implementations we have, um, you can only get like bounds that are functions of integers or actually intervals between integers. Um, that's what, what we did. Um, so that's just a, a side remark. Um, okay, I want to, oh yeah, also I should mention, so currently we're working on an implementation of that for Algorand's um, Teal uh, language. Um, 
Right, and why is that, um, um, why do I think that like this um, automatic amortized resource analysis is a particularly good fit uh, for smart contracts? So there are two reasons. Um, so first, um, uh, it, it is um, kind of like a, a problem potentially to um, add a fancy type system um, or kind of like a program logic to your smart contracts because to get the benefits from that, when you publish the smart contract, right, then um, this type, in our case, the resource bound has to be verified. Um, so otherwise, right, you, you um, don't get any, any benefit uh, from this. And so this um, is potentially a, 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 another attack surface for denial of service attacks, right, if people publish smart contracts where, you know, this um, bound is very, very difficult to verify. And here we can produce certificates so that like the bound checking is linear in the size of the certificate. And um, that's already good enough, right? Because then you can, if somebody has a big certificate, right, then you can uh, charge for that. Um, but you can also set it up, um, the analysis, so that the certificates are small, linear in the size of the, the program. But there's a trade-off then um, on the kind of like complexity of the bounds um, that, that you can, can get. Um, so um, the other um, big advantage here is that um, if you have a worst case bound, um, then um, this uh, does not help per se uh, with the problem of, of gas tracking. So um, now when you, you know, run a smart contract, then you have to um, um, keep track of what the gas cost is, right? To, the end charge the user for that, and that's um, uh, at some overhead. If you have a worst case bound, then you still want to charge um, the user of a smart contract only for the actual gas cost that was incurred and not for this um, very rare, potentially uh, worst case behavior that the bound um, addresses. So you would still, um, um, in general, have to do the tracking. But um, with this um, technique, and that's a result by Ankur Stas and Charles Kadir, you can actually um, use the derivation to automatically modify uh, the, the contract so that like in uh, particular branches where you're not on the worst case pass, you uh, return uh, some amount of gas to the user automatically. So there's a, still a little bit of like runtime overhead, but it's only you know in in a few branches, and it's much less than what you would have to do for, with the uh, uh, gas tracking. Okay, I'm um, out of time, um, so um, I have. Um, one more slide about NOMOS, um, which uh, is a, a smart contract language that um, we developed here. It has um, some of the uh, similar benefits that Jonathan was talking about, but it also has this automatic uh, gas tracking and it's based on session types. And uh, with that, so here are some of my now uh, former students uh, who have, uh, well, some are still here, some are former, um, who have worked on uh, this work. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for the talk. I was going to ask you to elaborate a bit. Um, you mentioned there was a trade off between the certificate size, perhaps the thickness of the bound. Could you say more about that? Yeah, and um, maybe not so, well, also the tightness, but some, um, um, it's also about kind of like how many. Um, programs you can automatically analyze. So sometimes, um, especially when you have like recursive functions, um, the uh, certificates might be like a little bit bigger um, um, than like what the code is. And there's like, yeah, it's a kind of like very technical detail. It's not so much like the bound, um, um, the complexity of the bound, what I said is probably not correct. It's more kind of like the, um, number of programs, the scope of like programs that you can analyze automatically. Yeah, if you do more fancy things there in the analysis, right, then the certificate's also gonna be bigger. Hello. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of the challenges here is that in general, constructing a derivation to prove uh, uh, to prove this could be undecidable, uh, but it works in, in practical cases, which is great. Uh, I wonder though, what, do you ever come up with, this, with exceptions? And if you have those, is it possible for the for the, per, the human to kind of help the solver constructing the derivations uh, themselves? Uh, no, it's not able, possible right now to do the derivations um, of themselves. Well, it actually. It, 
is in the in the imperative um, 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 case. So because there we have like this quantitative program logic, and there you could do the derivations yourself, not in the uh, type system case. So, um, however, what we do in practice to deal with that is uh, we modify the program so that it can be analyzed. Uh, um, the downside, and you can always do that in, in some way, um, um, and um, so we, we have this result. So it's the, the analysis is complete for p time. So every um, a mathematical function that is in p time, you can write a program that can be analyzed that implements that function. So um, in that sense, it's always possible. However, it's of course very difficult for a user to, to do that. And this is also something we work on kind of like on a general recipe um, of like how to, how can you rewrite your program so that it can be analyzed. 